Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 71, July 25th to July 31st, 1862. Just as a quick announcement before we get started, I mentioned we had new Patreon content, so we had a picture slideshow with commentary from the Battle of Malvern Hill, the Malvern Hill Battlefield, and what it looks like in the modern day. And once again, I think this is a good, easy battle to understand and understand exactly how the topography plays a role in the battle. So if that sounds like something that interests you, I have that on a slideshow link on the Patreon. You can check that out. I think also we're going to, since uh, we are pretty close to August here, going to roll out some, some more Patreon content. So we're going back to a memoir review. This one is Rebel Private Front and Rear. This is another memoir that is pretty high on the list of great Civil War memoirs. It's by William A. Fletcher. He serves in the Texas Brigade, and we've already had them engaged in several actions here already. And he actually goes on to, toward the end of the war, serve in Terry's Texas Rangers as well. So we'll talk about that and give a good rundown of the memoir and then give it a review. So if that sounds like something that interests you, that will be August's Patreon content. Last week, we talked Lincoln's draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. Just know that as we move forward, the president will be looking for a big event so he can ride the coattails of a win and roll it out. We also had a lesser-known law in the Anti-Bigamy Act, That was a good excuse for us to talk about the Mormon War or the Utah Expedition to close things out. This week we have a few scattered events. Belle Boyd is captured, among others, but I do want to check in briefly with what is going on with Ulysses S. Grant. It's actually been a while since we have talked about Grant and what he has been doing out here in the West. Obviously, Corinth was a big acquisition for the Union Army. Henry Halleck would divide up the armies and still keep Grant relatively sidelined. Grant still had no idea his superior had been behind him almost being removed from the army. During his time in Mississippi, Grant would often be bypassed in the chain of command. Essentially, he was watching from the bench. When he suggested that the army move in a way that better supported Pope, Halleck angrily responded to him. Grant would write that based off his response, he thought that perhaps he had suggested something unmilitary. Which speaks to exactly how dismissed and dismissive Halleck was. Such was the relationship between Halleck and Grant. Now, Halleck had been called to Washington, and Pope was going to be the new opponent for Lee in the Eastern Theater. Grant would receive command and have William Rosecrans as his subordinate. With Memphis fallen, he would briefly take up residency there. Don Carlos Buell was moving away with his army to solidify Tennessee and protect Kentucky. The goal for Grant would be to solidify the gains already made by the Union Army, protect the northern area of Mississippi already captured, and potentially work his way on Vicksburg. Additionally, forays into Alabama would be on the table. Grant, though, I think, was more happy to be relatively free. Halleck would start to bump heads with John McClernand, who was a politician and therefore untrustworthy. A fault of McClernand was that he was wishing to forge his own glory in the war 
leveraging his close relationship with President Lincoln. This shift for Halleck's ire away from Grant and onto McClernand would prove most fortunate for the hero of Shiloh and Fort Donelson. Grant did have a very different relationship with two subordinate generals I want to talk about. In the aftermath of Shiloh, he had formed a bond with William T. Sherman. It should be noted that the two needed to stick by one another to avoid blame for the surprise attack conducted by Albert Sidney Johnson. Sherman would break the normal habit of throwing his superior under the bus, much to the consternation of Halleck. The fact is interesting, Sherman does not like to mention Shiloh at all. He's asked about it in a congressional hearing, and he will skip over that battle, showing exactly how he felt about it. Now, whether this is his own embarrassment, that's probably part of it, that he was taken by surprise and, and he doesn't perform particularly well during the battle, or whether it's protecting Grant or protecting both of them that they've decided to form this bond, that's really the question. Halleck was not approving of the budding relationship. When Grant was thinking of resigning, as he was so frustrated with his role, it was Sherman, among other officers, who begged him to stay. Lincoln was also a fan of Grant, giving the famous quote, I cannot spare this man, he fights. It should be noted that the quote was reported by a man who had a propensity to exaggerate, but it is a good quote nonetheless. While partnership was forged with Sherman, the same cannot be said for George Thomas. Grant never forgave Thomas for being the general who took over his army of the Tennessee. To the credit of Thomas, he did wish to go back to his original command under Don Carlos Buell, giving the Army of the Tennessee back to Grant. Still, Grant was attempting to replace Thomas with Black Jack Logan prior to the Battle of Nashville, which sealed the fate of John Bell Hood's army in 1864. This replacement did not happen as Thomas was able to show enough aggression in eliminating the threat posed by Hood's rapidly deteriorating army. At that point, though, and we will get there, don't worry, the war was pretty much over in the West. But there's multiple accounts of Grant thinking very little of officers like Thomas, and this is just another example where he's very dissatisfied with Thomas's progress, so he wants him replaced with one of his own subordinates, Black Jack Logan. Grant will be able to forge relationships with his subordinate officers, and Black Jack Logan is no exception. Sherman's another one. Sheridan's another one after that. So he will have this habit of replacing officers he deems incompetent with others and putting more trust in them. On July 28th, we have continued action in Missouri. When last we left off there, Missouri was essentially lost to the Confederates after Pea Ridge. Van Doren moved his army into Mississippi, but Sterling Price was still around for the time being. Price would operate with Van Doren in the upcoming campaigns for Iuka and Corinth, by the way, so that just left guerrilla action against the Union troops in Missouri. Recruitment of new individuals to the Southern cause would relieve some pressure on Thomas Heinemann, who was defending Arkansas, as we have already mentioned, with the actions along the White River. John Poindexter, who we had actually introduced in earlier discussions on operations to disrupt the gathering of men for the Confederates, was trying to continue those efforts, but this time in the northeastern portion of the state. Likewise, Joseph Porter was also operating in a similar capacity. Porter is a bit of a controversial figure. He will be involved in guerrilla activity in Missouri until later in the war where he meets his demise. Porter is often credited with the lynching of two Union prisoners 
as retaliation for the likewise execution of a Confederate guerrilla. Porter and Poindexter would still see some success in recruitment, seeing as many as a thousand men join the cause. These were ill-trained, and of course, not as well supplied as the Union troops in the region. Two columns of Federal cavalry would attempt to converge and destroy the poorer quality rebels. These were dispatched by John Schofield, who was taking command of the region, being placed over all militia units in Missouri. Schofield was a New York native and had attended West Point prior to the war. Surprisingly, Schofield has already been involved in our story being placed on the staff of Nathaniel Lyon during the Wilson's Creek campaign. He will continue to rise in command, eventually becoming a corps commander under Thomas. This is particularly awkward considering I have seen it stated that Thomas had voted for Schofield's expulsion at West Point. After the war, Schofield will become the overall commander of federal troops, as well as the Secretary of War. As we move into the 20th century, Schofield does have an impact, as it was under his recommendation that a naval base be placed at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Odin Guitar was commanding one of the columns in 1862, which would make contact with the enemy in a place called Moore's Mill. Guitar was a Missouri native and had served two times in the House of Representatives. He would actually rise to the rank of Brigadier General before resigning his commission prior to the conclusion of the war to practice law. Moore's mill would see Porter's men attempt to ambush Guitar's cavalry. Of the two columns, the second had swung around to the flank of the rebels, so the odds were relatively even when Porter's men unleashed a volley at Guitar's Missouri and Iowa cavalry. I do want to take a minute to mention Iowa. They become very involved in Missouri. They're actually worried that guerrilla activity would expand into their state. They're very close to the northern portion of Missouri, so you often see Iowa cavalry units or Iowa units in general coming to support Missouri. Despite being even in numbers, what was not quite so even was that the Federals did have artillery. Once deployed, the hope was that it would drive off the undisciplined Confederates. Porter would urge his men to charge the Federals, which they did, driving the Union troops away from their guns. Before the victory could be exploited, the second column arrived, forcing the southern supporters to retreat. Casualties were 13 killed and 55 wounded for the Federals, while it is unclear the exact number of the Confederates. Estimations were often inflated by the Union officers, so I have seen anywhere between 25 and 200 casualties. Porter's men would actually be victimized again on August 6th at the Battle of Kirksville. Federals under John McNeil would draw out the fire from the guerrillas hiding in the town. Union troops would then overwhelm the rebels as they attempted to make a stand. Many were killed, wounded, or captured, most likely some 300 as compared with 88 northern casualties. This would seal northern Missouri for the Union. Now, McNeil is an interesting figure, as he will stay in Missouri throughout the war, being the primary opponent of Porter. He had been a descendant of Loyalists who had fled to Canada prior to the war. Like Porter, McNeil would have some controversy, being credited with what is known as the Palmyra Massacre. On July 29th, Bell Boyd would be arrested and imprisoned in the Old Capitol Jail, which is now the site of the current U.S. Supreme Court. Now, we have talked about spies and the roles that they played in a previous episode. In fact, we have continued to mention the role the Pinkerton Agency played during the faulty intelligence that George B. McClellan received during the Peninsula Campaign and the Seven Days.
Now we mentioned Belle Boyd, but I want to just go a little bit more in depth with her story during and then after the Civil War. Maria Isabella Boyd was born in Martinsburg, present-day West Virginia, in 1844. She was only 17 at the outbreak of the war, yet made a mark early. Following Jackson's early skirmish at Hook's Run, the Union Army would occupy her hometown. Boyd would defend her home and mother by killing a drunken Union soldier who may have been less than pure in his intentions with the property and the women. Despite the death of a Union soldier, Boyd was acquitted of the crime. This leads me to an interesting tangent that I would like to talk about and is even more evidence of the lack of what we call total war. I have seen several accounts of similar events and happening that result in deaths on both sides. It is sort of an interesting point to make that if soldiers are attempting to forage and steal without proper payment or otherwise cause harm, then harm might come to them and it may not be punishable on behalf of the citizen. Mostly, these acts are avoided, and although later in the war, there is an emphasis placed on denying the enemy, there is no outright killing of civilians, except perhaps maybe in guerrilla conflicts, which we will talk about. I may be off, but sometimes you definitely get a weird mix of the moral state of the country in the 1860s, combined with that old-timey harsh attitude toward life we often think about. For instance, it's almost as if we are saying, well, that was a bad man, or stealing was wrong, and so it makes sense he got what he deserves. Then there are no reprisals for the death because such was the attitude. I don't know if that's just me, but if you look in some of these memoirs, you can be the judge. Boyd has already been in our story as a matter of fact. While staying with family friends in Front Royal, she actually listened through a peephole to federal officers on the other side so that she could gather information about the army of Nathaniel Banks. Now, if you recall, Banks advances south while Jackson gives him the slip around Massanutten Mountain. Thus, the garrison at Front Royal is isolated. Jackson finds himself in a position to flank Banks and thus inflict the crushing victory at First Winchester. While Boyd was able to give Jackson the information that would allow the general to know the enemy troop dispositions, so he most likely got the green light to pull off his operation in destroying Banks. Henry Kidd Douglas, who writes a memoir, I Rode with Stonewall, after the war, would write about Boyd, but full disclosure, Douglas is often caught up in the fanciful side of the story than the factual, shall we say. General Taylor, who we talked about in connection with his action at Front Royal, also mentions Belle Boyd, although I do not believe he mentions her by name, but his is also sort of a fanciful tale. It's also interesting, we have these two accounts, though, that are corroborating one another, so certainly there is some truth in that. But was Belle Boyd, like, the second coming of Joan of Arc? Probably not. Edwin Stanton would arrest Boyd, but she would be exchanged and sent to Richmond. In 1863, she was arrested yet again. Toward the end of the war, she would become a courier with England, actually marrying a U.S. naval officer who aided in her escape. Belle Boyd used several tactics to gain information throughout her spying career, whether it was through flirtation or through hiding behind her young exterior. Often, Union officers would not think twice about the teenager in the room. While incarcerated, Boyd displayed her continued resilience to the cause. She would hang Confederate flags out of her cell and sing Dixie. There was also reportedly a message system between herself and friends on the outside. After the war, Belle Boyd would write a memoir of her story as well as become an actor. During this time, she would model herself the Cleopatra of Secession, among other colorful names. In 
she would be widowed, remarried, and divorced, and remarried, producing a variety of children. Unfortunately, she would die in relative poverty while touring in Wisconsin. I have seen accounts of Boyd actually dying of a heart attack on stage, which I think is sort of interesting. If I may proceed with a terrible joke, probably the second most famous death at a theater playgoers remembered in the immediate aftermath. Boyd is actually buried in Wisconsin Dells, where she was performing at the time. Just as a quick note, we also had a death this week, or at least immediately previous to the current week. On July 24th, 1862, we have the death of the 8th President of the United States, Martin Van Buren. Now, you may be wondering exactly why I would be mentioning the death of the former president, other than that we have a little bit of a lighter week and I need to kill a little bit more time. No, the reason that Van Buren is important is because he was essentially the founder of the Free Soil Movement, thus one of the founders of the Republican Party. During our more in-depth rundown about the Mexican-American War, we might have mentioned this fact, although to be fair, John Quincy Adams was a free soiler before it was cool. Van Buren had been a Democrat and actually was the vice president under Andrew Jackson. So it is quite the stretch to be ending up in the direction he finally found himself. Van Buren would win the 1836 election, beating, among others, William Henry Harrison. His presidency was not necessarily an effective one, seeing economic downturn. A policy for someone who straddled the fence perhaps was one of not stirring the pot either, domestically or abroad. Texas and slavery were both big issues, but Van Buren did not want to antagonize either side. In fact, his administration appealed the original decision of the Amistad to the Supreme Court. If you recall, this was a decision that freed the captured Africans who took control of the slave ship following the barring of any continual Atlantic slave trade. Van Buren's middle-of-the-road tactics would be his undoing, and the following year, William Henry Harrison would again gain the Whig candidacy. Harrison was advertised as the opposite to Van Buren, and as a result would win fairly handily. Van Buren was split from the Democratic Party in 1848 and actually run in that election under the Free Soil ticket. Sort of interesting that he was able to have a change of heart and flip away from the indecision that marred his presidency. Anyway, now we have said goodbye to Martin Van Buren, we can call it a day. We had some continued attempts in Missouri to raise troops against the Union. It is kind of telling that perhaps there is a bit of traction in that state. Each time, they are unsuccessful, but they are getting good amounts of men to sign up for the cause. This is going to translate into, if not joining the regular Confederate Army, it is going to translate into increased guerrilla activity. We also talked about Bell Boyd, who was arrested a few times, this time being detained in the old Capitol prison. Next week, we will head to Louisiana and then say goodbye to the short-lived career of the CSS Arkansas. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.